Thank you, uh, Pedro and, uh, and Rob, for inviting me to give this talk, uh, which is uh, co-authored by uh, Yolanta Miedikoska and uh, Betsy Arnold. So as you all know, um, the uh, classification, the current classifications are um, based on phylogenies, and, and those ph therefore these classifications are capturing, in a, in a way, the evolutionary history of, of these fungi, and also, to a certain degree as well, their ecology and their biology in general. So, so therefore, if we want to really gain a better understanding of those classifications, it's important that we look at their evolutionary history. Um, so here, what we did, for instance, is this is the, a chronogram uh, or divergence time tree for the fungi. And one important fact is that, for instance, the diversification of the extent Ascomicota took place about more than 100 million years before the diversification of the Basiomicota. Also, interestingly, the diversification of the, uh, of the Pesdomicotina, which is the uh, subject of this presentation, um, it took place more or less at the same time as the diversification of the Basiomicota, the entire clade, uh, around 480 million years ago. Um, also, radiations uh, or drastic acceleration of, of uh, 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 diversification um, took uh, our drastic, have a drastic impact on, on phylogenies and on biodiversity. And so here what we did using Medusa was to, we discover four major drastic acceleration in diversification rates, and therefore you can see this as radiations. And the most important one of those is here within the Pesdomicotina, the Leoshomiceta, which I will refer to as the Leoshomiceta radiation. So, all, of course, these fungi have not evolved in a vacuum. We know that they are interacting with plants. So in collaboration with uh, Susanna Megayon, we have also uh, estimated a, a divergence, uh, the divergence time for uh, plants, land plants, or embryophytes. And we have found five major acceleration of diversification and also two deceleration in blue. And um, one that is really important here, the most important diversification in uh, or radiation that took place, it, whoops, is here at the base of the tree, and it corresponds to the origin of the tracheophytes or vascular plants. Now, the beauty of this, because these are chronograms, is that we can align them and we can zoom in. And now what we can see here, there's this faint pink bar here, is that the largest radiation within the um, fungi, which is the Leoshomiceta radiation, took place more or less at the same time as the largest radiation of land plant, which is, as I said, uh, is associated with the origin of vascular plants. That's pretty amazing. So, so this is all important, I think, to understand, as I said, these, these classification of, of fungi and here in the context of the Pesum catena, their evolution. So, um, also, um, how important is the Leoshum Seta radiation? Well, 57,000 of the 100,000 species that have been described so far are within this, uh, this group. And we know that there is way more species out there that wait to be uh, discovered. And we think that many of these unknown fungi are actually also falling within the Leoshomiceta. We're saying this because if most of the endolichenic and endophytic fungi are falling within the Leoshomiceta or Pesdomicotina. And so this, as for most of you who have worked on these fungi, uh, on endolichenic or endophytic fungi, the, it's, it's, it's an hyperdiversity that is mind-boggling. I mean, it's really amazing. And, and it's, we're just, as much as, as hard as we're trying to capture this diversity, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. And most of this diversity that we're discovering 
of endophytic and endolichinic fungi is also falling within this, um, the Pesodomicotina. Now, this, if you look at the distribution of this, these endolichinic and endophytic fungi, it gives the impression that the origin, their origin would be here uh, early associated with the origin of Pesodomicotina. Um, and we think that this is doubtful because for two reasons. Um, endolichinic fungi cannot originate before lichens, and we think that uh, the origin of uh, ascolichens took place here between 400 and 440 million years ago, and also endophytes or endophytic fungi cannot originate before the uh, radiation, or not the radiation, but the diversification of land plants. So, we think that during this early evolution here of the Pesdomicotina and also of the Leushomiceta, before, uh, sorry, before the, um, the uh, diversification of land plants, we think what happened is that they were in association with, with algae and uh, with uh, cyanobacteria or other unicellular or filamentous uh, photoautotrophs. And um, this was demonstrated in a really nice paper by uh, Holm and um, Murray in Science in 2014, where they demonstrated that there seems to be a latent capacity for fungal algal mutualism. And they demonstrated this by doing physiological uh, studies uh, where they show that across the saccharomycotina uh, 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 and, uh, and the tephrinomycotina, there seems to be this uh, association with algae, what, and also to a certain degree, also with, uh, within the Pesodomicotina. So there is this latent capacity that seems to be there. They demonstrated this with these different yeasts and, and in association in co-growth experiment with uh, Chlamydomonas. So, um, so what we think happened during that early evolution before the uh, diversification of land plant is that we think there was this, um, the, the Ascomycota and Pesomycotina were in symbiotic association with green algae and other unicellular or filamentous photoautotrophs. And then more recently, this association with green algae and cyanobacteria continue, or if you want, expanded within lichens that then originated, and then that gave rise to endolichinic fungi. And then, more recently, uh, there were host switches by endolichinic fungi to bryophytes and new lineages of tracheophytes as they originated and transformed the terrestrial landscape. And that gave rise to endophytic fungi. So this is a hypothesis, of course, and um, we're trying to uh, explore that. Now, um, Let's look at what are those uh, classes that, are, uh, that I was um, mentioning earlier without telling you what they were. So here we have the Erosomyces. So it's green here, but actually we know that uh, the, large, the largest fraction of Erosomyces are non-lichenized. Uh, Dutzdomyces here should be partially green because there, we know there are some lichens in uh, this uh, class. And then we have these three classes that are mostly lichen-forming fungi, and then with these three classes here that are, uh, we know that as far as we know so far, we never found any lichen-forming fungi part of these uh, clades. So, um, it's also the number of species we think, so this is another way of looking at the diversity. So here what we have is a summary of all the relationships uh, among the known um, Pesdomicotina. And um, what we have here are the numbers of species as reported in the Dictionary of the Fungi. And here, the last column, if you look at the last column, these numbers are the number of strains that the Arnold Lab has uh, isolated from 10, a total of 10 sites. This is a more than 12,000 cultures. And these cultures comes Five of these sites comes, uh, are, were in a uh, circumboreal belt, so mostly boreal biome. And then uh, the other five were mostly from uh, North America and mostly uh, from boreal to temperate and uh, subtropical uh, in one case. So 
we think that in that pool, we have about 800 new species of fungi, and we think that if we would select, based on that information, we think that if we select carefully four more sites, only four more sites, we, and we would also include non-culture-based um, uh, methods, such you know, if we use uh, short reads with Illumina, for instance, we think we could find 4,500 new species within the Pisidomycotina, 4,000 of which would be in the Leoshomiceta, just four more sites. Okay, so it's, it's, the diversity is, is immense, and, and, and it's, um, it's there waiting for us to, to capture. Um, it's not just the number of species that is phenomenal within the Leoshomiceta and Pisidomycotina, it's also, we think that the discovery of new uh, fungi will also be deep lineages within the Leoshomiceta and Pisumicotina. So an example, this is happening already. So for example, in 2012, Gazis et al. found a new class, the Xylonomycetes. Um, so new class of fungi in 2012. Um, this took about six locusts to determined this, that they were really within the Aleushomiceta, but as you see, there was not enough support here, but clearly it was something separate from all the other classes we knew so far. Um, another example, uh, a new order in the one of the, I would say, the class, the most studied class of fungus that is around, and, um, and yet in 2015, Chen et al., uh, describe a new uh, order, the Pheomuniele elis, and um, this was discovered by Rossman and, and Shaw et al. in 2010, um, and, and Guedin and Aptrout et, et al. in 2014 even gave a provisional name for this clade. But it's uh, when um, we included endophytes from gymnosperms, of all things, uh, mostly from southern areas, so temp southern temperate and, and subtropical, suddenly we found many interesting um, endophytes that are in gymnosperm, and then it gives, it shed new light on our understanding of the evolution of this order, which is shaped in large part by this association, this endophytic association with gymnosperms. And this is a very diverse uh, group of fungi trophically. So you have lichen forming fungi, saprotroph, phytopathogenic, endolichenic, endophytic. I mean, it's really amazing, all in this order. Um, and also, it sheds new light uh, with regard to uh, pathogen like Dolabra uh, on, on uh, lychee uh, crop, for instance. So, a lot to learn. Another example, the Coniocibomyces that were discovered or described by Pietro et al. 2012. This is mostly lichen-forming fungi and um, it represent an independent origin of the mesidium. So all this, this is all nice and it's happening at a fast rate and I don't think we've peaked. I think it will increase. And I think the take-home message, one of the take-home messages, is that these deep lineages were discovered and described using cultures and multilocus phylogenies. So without you know, using only culture-independent methods, that would not be possible. We have to remember that. Okay, another thing that's important to realize is that unstable phylogenies equal unstable uh, classifications. So here what we did was to summarize the relationships and the dashed lines represent internodes that have never received high support values from any study. Okay, so to have a full line here, all you need is one study that reported high support value. Okay, so here we did for the Dimension of Biodiversity project, the DOB project, we did a, a phylogeny, we uh, uh, estimated the relationship for 982 reference taxa using six loci. And then you see that if you do this, you lose some of the support that we know is probably there. The topology is exactly the same. It's just that we're losing some of the support. That's the tree. 
as you can see, there's a lot of difference, the differences in rates of uh, molecular evolution. And then when you add 2,000 endolycanic or endophytic OTUs to this, it's becoming, there's still structure. The, the classes are still monophyletic, but you have almost no support. And you have still these clays that are uh, shaped by their host that are still appearing. So these are the pink or pale uh, lilac <coughs> are endolycanic. These are associated with moss, for instance. So there's still a lot of signal, but how far can we go? Can we add another 100,000 to this? Because that's, and still, that's not much, right? So <coughs> we need to, we need more loci. And so this is a, a tree that was uh, based on 27 loci. It was done in collaboration with uh, Joey Spadafora and Conrad Shaw and Barbara Robertsi as part of a half tall two. And for the first time, we were able, with high support, to resolve the Leoshium seta radiation. So every time you see a black box here, it means that one of the analyses were supporting this strongly. Now, if we recognize the Leoshium seta as a super class, for instance, then it leaves us no rank to name these clades, these important clades here. That's okay. We can, um, I mean, there's many, out I'm not proposing this as a solution, but let's say that that's what we're doing. Then we, we can use these kind of clade names. And for instance, the first split that took place in the Leosho Miseta, on the left arm here, we have the Sordario Mycoid clade, which is this well-known sister relationship between sordariomycetes and neoshomycetes. And then on the right arm of this first split, we have what we call the lecanero mycoid clade, and which is including all the classes. So all, lichen, all ascolichens are included in that clade. Then within this clade, we have on the left side the dutzio mycoid clade, which involves, again, and includes a well-known sister relationship between artoniomycetes and dutzidiomycetes. And on the right side, we have the erosiomycoid clade, <coughs> within which we have what we call the lichinomycoid clade, which includes the lichinomycetes, lichinomycetes, and coniocibomycetes, which is not shown here. So, <coughs> for conclusions, to establish reliable phylogeny, phylogenetic base classification, we are still dependent on fungal strains and pure culture. Deep relationships within Pizomycotina are old and involve the largest fungal radiation, the Leoshomyceta, which occurred between 440 and 400 million years ago. And also we need, uh, so genome-wide data are needed. So transcriptomics, genomics, and DD rad seeks are all needed because we need a large number of loci to resolve the Leoshomyceta radiation, for instance. So this is, again, this uh, is also important for the classification that are derived from these classification, from these phylogenies, sorry. Um, and also we cannot sequence, the, of course, the genome of all strains we find, uh, even if we're uh, moving forward very quickly. Um, but, uh, so, but we think that the Sanger sequencing um, of the ITS LSU, which is the entire ITS plus 600 base pair at the five prime end of the LSU, which is about a 1.2 KB uh, fragment, is still very powerful to determine relationship and to discover new lineages. And also, for species that cannot be grown, of course, in culture, short reads from uh, next-gen sequencing of amplicons targeting ITS-1 and ITS-2, for example, are useful for species that speciated recently and when extensive data is available for close relatives. So how do we need to integrate all this information. As you see, the data is coming from, is in, in all kinds of form and shape and, and, and in different amounts, and we need to integrate that to be successful. And so here I just want to um, mention that on Friday, as part of this symposium, there will be a special session on integrating unknown fungi into the tree of life, where we will uh, showcase the uh, uh, online service that was developed by Ignacio Carbone as part of the Dimension of Biodiversity, which is called TBAS. 
And um, so this will show one way we found to, or that we're developing, to integrate all this information and to, um, to uh, really um, integrate unknown fungi into the tree of life. So, um, of course, there was a lot of people involved in this project, um, and um, I'm thankful to all of them, and of course, uh, multiple grants from NSF and the Department of Energy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francois, for that really exciting uh, overview of this uh, endophytic work. The floor is open now for some questions. So, Francois, why aren't there more uh, fungi on bryophytes if they have uh, ascomycetes if they evolved earlier with these uh, photosynthetic films and things? So, the question is why there's well, not. Why, why aren't there more? Ascomycetes associated with bryophytes if they evolved, if, if the ascomycete lineage evolved uh, prior to the tracheophytes? There are many. Well, I, I know there are, but there doesn't seem to be as, as wide a diversity as I would expect if they had evolved. Oh, no, they're, they're, it's huge. Is it? Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. And the interesting thing about this is that we have demonstrated by doing um, studies of uh, fungal communities found in lichens, so these endolichenic fungi that the communities that we find in, in, in lichens are most similar to the communities that we find in bryophytes. And, 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 and another way of saying this is that the community of fungi, of endophytic fungi in bryophyte is less similar to the rest of the, the community that we find in the other plants than, than to a lichens. So there's something going on there, and we think that it might be because of this early evolution and this, this transition that took place probably from lichens to bryophyte first. And the, somehow it has been maintained. I'm not sure exactly if it's because uh, they are close to the ground or they are in the same kind of habitat, but it's a, an interesting, but it, there's a lot of diversity in bryophytes. <coughs> Francois, I was just wondering, you, you've got thousands of new species and you have cultures. I miss plan B. How are you going to uh, ensure that, that they get named? So, so that's a really, really challenging point, and I'm glad you asked your question, because on Friday we want, I think, what we have to do, uh, initially with the Dimension of Biodiversity Project, we were, the idea was that, okay, we'll have an idea of where these fungi are falling, and then we will just ask the experts, hey, we have this culture for this group. We know it's in your group. Are you interested? But it's, it's not ideal. I think what's better is what we will present on, on, on Friday, which is an online system where you, everyone, it will be public, so everyone can see where those fungi are falling. You can zoom in and out of this gigantic tree, so it's really amazing. And you can then click on a node, and you will download all the alignment. So you can download the alignment, and you can say, I want the six genes that are, involved, that are present. And you can say, I want also the ecological data that comes with this. Also, you can ask, because the two most, I mean, for me as a phylogeneticist, the two most limiting factor are generating alignments and these uh, tables of, of, of voucher tables that are just becoming extremely difficult to generate. So imagine if you could do this with a click of a button and download all these alignments, and then also you can bring in your own cultures or your own uh, ITS or LSU sequences, and you can see where they fall on that tree, or you can just compare your phylogeny with the phylogeny there and see where they fall in and still get all these alignments. Now, once we think that the power to get back to your question is that once people will have these alignments in their camp with their own culture, you know, these will be the experts for that group, and they bring all their knowledge plus all their own material to this, I think that's when the description of species will be happening faster, I hope, and it will be worldwide and it will be simultaneous, and I hope that this will work. 